phone and I wanted to give a display of, of, of pictures in PowerPoint, but I, but I want to, you know, I like to discuss the term ecology as an important part in the reassessment of design's role with social and environmental issues. Now, ecology is a, a useful context for understanding how design can play a role in sustainable change. Now, in the field of art installations or paintings or, or uh, even indoor projects, uh, ecology is a key concept in considering design place in their certain areas or, uh, of concentration. And that would be natural, artificial, unnatural systems of everyday life. Now, the natural aspect and how it relates to ecology, it would mean that uh, anything that, uh, that exists despite us, including like our biological cells, plants, animals, and the physical environment. But there's another aspect, which is artificial, which exists because of us. And, and this is the man-made element of actions of human activity. We, we talk about cities, buildings, artwork, and, and graphics. Then there is the unnatural uh, mode, which means that uh, that exists within our minds. So uh, as thought, theory, and concepts, this allows us to understand the complexity of the natural world. So, uh, and so I think we construct reality or nature from our own perspectives as, as human beings, but, uh, but by developing a design that's more sustainable, uh, just has more sustainable practices, design becomes a part of the solution rather than the problem. Now, moving away from the uh, un unsustainable process. Now, we, well, real, what, um, when I speak of design, we wanna move in sort of new ways of, of being or doing to help individuals and communities to live better and generate, generate the, uh, uh, or regenerate the social fabric. Now, e ecology, it addresses the context of good design, uh, pushing forward a human activity that contributes to sustainable change uh, through works of art and artifacts. Ecology is, is a very influential word, and it could be, uh, ecology can be used as a metaphor or it also as a movement uh, in our contemporary world. So it, in a more comprehensive way, it's a way of looking at the Earth's patterns and unique ecosystems. Now, ecology grounds the artist toward a more holistic view of nature rather than this uh, mechanical perspectives. And sometimes when I, as you know, familiar with our history, we can see the, the futurist movement where, you know, we became obsessed with uh, uh, movement through cars, automobiles, uh, technology uh, during the early 20th century. But the natural world is very much designed as a system that interacts and interconnecting relationships. That's the key of moving toward a firm foundation toward good design. Now we're giving the artist a keen sensitivity to the relationships uh, with our environment and the effects of all actions, of our actions. Now, the word ecology there, there's uh, three approaches to a, uh, ecology. And then it, it is like the intellectual approach, which embraces a holistic view of nature. Then we have the political uh, form of ecology, which highlights uh, in environmental and social problems. And so the artists, you know, artists, we create artifacts or we create installations that explore justice and equality as a pathway uh, to recovery. Now, 
there is an emotional realm uh, that connects to ecology and this suggests living in harmony with the world and being a responsible caring citizen okay now from ecology we there's a sort of like it, it emerges the notion of sustainability and that you know we've heard that word many times but from ecology sustainability is a response it's a response toward ecological issues so how do we so sort of like through our responses we can avert environmental crisis now uh, so and, and this allows us to make very uh say responsible considerations toward our environment and we move toward new artistic expressions that enhance new perspectives. You know, we can take a, uh, a different perspective on uh, like recyclables or reusable, multi-uses or, or of, of, of an artifact or, or an installation. So as a metaphor, ecology inf it emphasizes a system of design that supports the artificial realm of engaging uh, engaging interactive concepts. Now, sustainable development, there, it's defined as this, and it, it sort of came out uh, like during the uh, uh, 1980s, I think there was a, a, a Brentland report that really begin to look at how we treat or our concerns about the environments which in which we live, but and they've defined so like uh, excuse me sustainable development as a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to to meet their own needs. So. So this different response uh, with ecology is a call to artists to create a non-destructive practice uh, uh, which aligns with e ecological recovery as well as changing our future. So, so a discourse on sustainable practices is really, it opens the debate about moving society away from being a victim of machine culture, but a designer who is empowered to build new theoretical and conceptual installations or artifacts that gives an audience different perspectives toward art forms, and as well as it, the interaction and in working together within a complex ecosystem. Now, these ecological interactions can be seen, it's very, it has a, a mythological theme. It, it, it's a, a, so like I would say, a, a mythological driving point of narratives that can transform our understanding of art forms. As, you know, because we're looking at being um, environmentally responsible and sustainable. It's important for designers to reassess their role in designing a habitable world, creating artifacts that take on a life of its own through a system of actions between the art form and the environment. Establish a creative sensitivity to our relationship with our world. Now, this project, this is a project for all involved in the systems of everyday life. By embracing a culture of living, we design art forms that, uh, that we consider as sustainable and, and as a kind of change for the better. This approach, this ecological approach uh, to design, it generates weaving together 
say natural, the natural, the artificial, and the unnatural of various ecosystems and it support and it supports a sustainable change. So this is the topic that uh, that I would like to present, and I we can open that up for a debate. Um, Bill, I have some, uh, I'm going to screen share one of your projects. Um, um, let's see here. Um, let me pull it up. I can. Um, when he says debate, um, does anybody have comment? Like, what are you talking about? Bill? Um, there's, there's words that we want to pull out of this because the project that we're going to be executing deals with, you know, um, how many of you have been down Foreign Road and you looked at how, um, well, this project that we're working on, how is it going to be sustainable? You know, anyone want to address that? Okay, yeah, you know, sustainability, it's, it's uh, we create things that it may change, it could alter uh, in relationship to its environment, but what it does, it gives insight for the younger generation to build upon what is present. And, and, and maybe they would like to creatively take that design further, uh, do various improvements, maybe you know, having a look at a, a mythological perspective, or it's just a way of interacting and coming up with uh, a system of actions that bring livelihood uh, to the installation that is present. I'm gonna share uh, your website. Yeah. Uh, and this is a Bill's environmental garden. Can you guys see that? And this is about an acre um, and, and Bill, you want to talk a little bit about your environmental garden and how you reshape this? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was desolate when I approached it. And it took, you know, we didn't have, we started out with maybe three people uh, coming up with uh, design concepts. And, uh, you know, I sometimes I look at it as, as various living rooms of, of, of natural spaces. And then you explore plant life and how it adapts to, you know, sun or shade environments. Then we we move into a category of of uh, water resources. You know, there's an area that is very, uh, you know, like water tolerant, and um, that you know that could be easily looked upon as a, a rainwater. Uh, area of the garden but you know it's 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 all about uh creating it's like walking into a gallery where you have a living collection of plant species some that are cultivars as well as uh native plants and so i try to create an environment where it's there it's cohesive but it's interactive and uh, it, it's, it's a very exciting uh, way of, of looking at garden design. And then if you want to introduce your project with the Botanical Nature Center and how you formed this partnership with the, um, the Metro line. Oh yeah. Um, yes, it, that happened, um, oh God, it could have been like set, uh, eight or nine years ago. And I, you know, living, uh, a lifetime resident of Woodlawn, I um, connected with the University of Chicago and Southeast Chicago Commission. And so out of that conversation, I decided to create a botanical space, uh, you know, on my block uh, along Metro train lines. So uh, with the help of Metro uh, university members, as well as community, I was able to uh, create a, a walkthrough of native plants or, or a collection of, of plant diversity uh, in the area. It took a lot of work because um, 
I mean, it was desolate. <laughs> there, I mean, we had to dig through debris uh, in order to, uh, to make this project come alive. And so, um, yeah, it's, and, and I think that's, that was the beginning of my venture into, uh, I call it the Dorchester Botanical Garden. And the images that I'm showing are, Bill is also a photographer and how he takes his um, art form and uh, uh, uses it, um, you know, in his work. So we have to think about how we document the work that we're doing uh, with this placemaking um, because all of us have a different perspective of how we look at, you know, the, the horizontal landscape. Anyone else have questions uh, for Bill? Um. Uh, I, I don't have any uh, questions, but I did kind of want to elaborate on uh, on the sustainability and what um, what Bill was uh, talking about when he said, you know, it, it that the space economy allow, allows for the next generation to kind of pick things up and um, and add to it. You know, it, it's it's a very flexible space for for the community. Um, one thing uh, we're working with Bill um, uh, to elaborate on the botanical garden uh, entirely. Um, one way that I was kind of able to work with Bill is is through that uh, through that sustainability that he's talking about, where um, in, inside that same garden, uh, around it, um, uh, around the path of it is uh, our uh, solar powered uh, encapsulated clouds, where uh, where it, you know it's uh, it's it's made out of very simple objects, uh, a tree stump, uh, the solar colorful solar panel light. Um, polyfill in a serving bowl and tray, which, which, uh, which is actually um, uh, all chrome. So it reflects the sky. All of it is just, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a reverse camouflage where it brings the, the background forward. Um, and, and it just, and it all just blends, you know, it, and it, uh, and it's, it's eco design. And that, that's, I just wanted to just, you know, throw that in there as, you know, as a way that, um, that, you know, as an example of how, you know, that sustainability has, you know, has been present. Yeah, another thing I wanted to add as well is that, you know, uh, years ago, at, uh, being a student of, for the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, you know, I had took a, a number of courses on installation, but I would, you know, I became fascinated with architecture where I would, you know, just spend the whole day in a, a sort of like a skyscraper or, or some point and figure out, you know, as I, you know, how would I transform that space to make it eco-friendly or, you know, where there's a human interaction between environment and uh, the structure of, of, of city life. So, you know, those things are helpful because I think through uh, spending time in the space, exploring options that are available to, to design to make a better design that's, that's uh, ecologically safe and, uh, and open to new modes of, of thinking, you know, new modes of being. So, um, you know, Shona, do you have any ideas? Because one of the main um, objectives of this beautification project, of course, is about the greenscape, is about how we're, again, the human interaction um, and how we build around it and be inclusive of it. Um, because we look at the, the people that are working on Florence, the people that are driving home, that have homes on Florence, that use it as a thoroughfare to come and go and to shop. And then we also have the, um, you know, the homeless population that, you know, that's where they're exploiting the streets and nooks and crannies of where they could build their, their shanties, you know, along that corridor, you know, in terms of urban blight. Um, and then how we work as artists, you know, to not create an environment 
Um, but how do we sustain this project after we leave, after we install it? We have we know that we have a five year, you know, commitment to um, you know keep it you know restored. But after that, what happens? You know, and then what happens as we phase in and help change the mindset of of the community that currently uses the space? Um, we did a walkthrough of the space last Monday, and um, well, two Mondays ago. And then we had to look at all the activities that happen in this parking area in the back of the, where the museum is located. And so we had, and we looked at what's there currently and what we have to work with, what worked, what didn't work, you know. Um, Shona, you wanna speak to that or you're gonna stay on mute? <laughs> I mean, all well, of you what that are in Sacramento, you see, you know, talk about that. And we, then we talk about our vision and how we can really make this vision work as artists. Well, one of the two things, um, we, uh, Judah and Prisco and, and Lee, just so you and, I, and, and, and Larry, um, we're looking at uh, three murals down Florence uh, two in the back parking lot, the back wall of the quality tune-up, and then um, the one uh, mural in the back parking lot. But also we, uh, we've we um, located another building. We're just trying to get approval. It's, a, um, I think it's a at and T building uh, down Florham Road across from that Kentucky Fried Chicken, the side, that side wall very nice walls, size of a wall. But as we walked the back parking lot, um, I thought about incorporating um, art on the trees uh, in the back parking lot. Uh, and I think Alpha mentioned um, um, in Chicago, they have um, a space where they have uh, created the burlap around the trees and then they put uh, they paint on top of the burlap and that's um, placed around the trees and the long wall that we're talking about uh, in the back parking lot it has a lot of bushes in front of it so one of the things I would tell uh, 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 Fisco, Judah, Lee, um, the artists that I know will be working on that particular mural is how do we incorporate, you know, um, uh, some type of design around all of the bushes that's in, in front of that wall. Um, so just be thinking along those lines. Um, we thought about, we we thought about putting uh, maybe a mural there dedicated to to children and youth maybe with some cultural designs or something like that, uh, symbols, um, but also just in, just think that I think there's like six or eight bushes in front of that wall, miniature bushes. So just be thinking about how can we incorporate, you know, that design element into the murals. And as Bill was talking about uh, looking at ecology, um, in green space, you know, um, and look at that as our canvas um, and how we, you know, like we know that that rock area, you know, probably didn't work, you know. So they're looking at bringing aggregated rock in, you know, and bark in and helping even to look at the concrete area as a place to think about the color, you know, and painting you know, a mural onto the concrete area beyond the wall. Um, so there's a lot of ways for each of you to think about the approach and look at it as a blank slate, but also look at what's currently there and how you beautify that, you know what I mean, in within that space. And then, and, and making sure that, no, we're not the gardeners, but we're not going back in. And think about like you put a mural up and then you walk away. You know what I mean? But with this kind of project, you put the mural up, 
how do you sustain it? How do you sustain the area around it? You know what I mean? How do you come back and be, you know, like stewards of the space and not just come and drop an art project down and then we walk away? So this is something that we have to think about in placemaking um, in any project that we're doing it's not only the upkeep if somebody tags it or whatever, it gets faded. How do we go back into the space? But with, uh, with that's with murals in the community. But when we're creating placemaking, think about how people are going to use the space and how do we maintain the integrity of the art, you know, that we're bringing out there. And when she said the burlap, that was a project that was done through the Illinois Arts Council where I taught these students to, to paint um, symbols on burlap and with the burlap, because it's a natural fiber, take it and adorn the trees that were part of their community garden that was outside in the back of the school. And so that there, you know, I'll show you later images, but it's snow, you know what I mean? And you have a white canvas and snow, and then the color pops out. And then you have a biodegradable like burlap that after time dissipates and it doesn't harm nature. So you have to think about, you know, the products that we use, the things that are the purpose that we use in, in, our, in our art. And, um, and those are some of the things that we talked about in the narrative that we wrote the grant. They wanted to look at how, you know, the, the use of the green space, you know, and then how uh, I think that within that placemaking project, they, they're going to have activities out there where people come back out and congregate, you know, and then they dissipate and then they congregate and then they dissipate. And the art is something that um, it's not the backdrop, you know, but it helps cultivate community to be a part of that space. Yes, and to support what Alpha had just said is, um, you know, having a botanical garden uh, or even a garden, uh, like during the winter seasons, everything is, appears to be dead. But we can bring that uh, a new life energy, you know, maybe bringing in evergreens, uh, you know, different type of plant species that survive throughout the winter and discover these new forms is, is so exciting. And so I think we just have to kind of be aware of, of the possibilities uh, of different plant forms according to the seasons. Um, and the project that Devon is working on is a project that happened 20, in 2014 um, Devon, do you have any photos of that you want to share? Uh, let me uh, let me double check. Does uh, he have to have the uh, control, um, Liza? Can I interject about the plants? Here, you're going to have to really think about water and conservation of water. And, uh, and, you know, our season out here is, uh, you know, you don't get any rain uh, for, uh, you know, all during the summer months and things like that. So uh, take that into consideration, please, because if you don't, uh, it, won't, it won't work if you don't have the water conservation and the rain, the lack of rain that we have. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. I mean I mean, that's a good observation. And that's one of the ones that we looked at when we were doing the walkthrough with Tom uh, Donaldson, the property owner, and with Lisa from the utility district, Sacramento Utility District, and uh, Shona and myself and a couple other team members met there to talk about that. You know, And it is a serious drought here in Sacramento um, and a lot of dried space. So, the color with the metal chairs and how we paint those chairs and how we structure those installations kind of takes the eye, you know, like the visual eye as you're coming down the horizontal landscape away from that drought look, you know what I mean? And, and, and then the type of plants, I think that um, drought resistant plants that they were talking about putting out there, you know, along, um, 
along the, the, the street in terms of yeah, you can, can apply for the funding. Succulent. Yeah, uh, can apply for the funding to change their, um, you know, their, their uh, green space uh, without having to be, deal with the water issue. I think we, we did talk about that and we did cover it. And then we saw, you know, like even at Burbank, Luther Burbank, there's an ideal, um, Mary, uh, I think, Mr. Nixie, I think you're frozen. Are you just staying? Um, you know, with, um, with Burbank, it's a, you know, it's a hill, a mount where the chairs will look really uh, majestic. I mean, standing there, you know, the, the height of the hill that they're on, but all of that area is dry dirt area, you know, which will be good for the installation of the, uh, you know, some of the chairs of that space. Shona? Yes, and um, I know they're gonna plant a couple of trees as well, but uh, I think um, the city is gonna pay for uh, 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 the space there to, to put the uh, water features underneath the ground to help with uh, watering in that area. And so um, I do like the idea though, uh, Pastor Larry of um, the succulent flowers, placing those uh, probably around uh, the, the areas where I mentioned the, the uh, bushes are even around the area where we're talking about putting uh, the uh, the taller chairs along with uh, what did uh, Raw called the rocks um, alpha the was the arrogant yeah those that rock feature and then a few of the wood chips but also placing maybe some succulents in that area I do like that of course I love succulents but yeah, I do like that. Mm -hmm. My problem with uh, wood chips is uh, they don't stay. Uh, you know, they will be, they disappear uh, in a short amount of time. Um, decomposed granite and things like that uh, will, will stay. But uh, wood chips is, I, in my opinion, for public, I've done a lot of public art and wood chips are, are things that uh, kids love to play with, throw, kick, and and it's gone in a short time. But decomposed granite looks nice. You could do that, or you know, something like that. But if you use any kind of pebbles, rocks, or something, the kids will get it, and it'll be everywhere. Thank Larry. Definitely. They're looking at ways so that won't happen. <laughs> definitely, they talked about that. So we definitely don't want that to happen. So we're looking to uh, see what we can do uh, to put there uh, so they look nice, and um, none of those activities will happen. Hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, uh, taking a look. I mean, my background in soil analysis is that, you know. Uh, wood chips or, or wood takes a long time to decompose and it doesn't really help the garden bed in itself because it I mean it, there's it's you know like a year or so to decompose but you can actually force the soil to work uh, uh, for and, and allow that to be beneficial by just a skim of fertilizer would activate uh, certain soils in, in, within certain areas. Thank you, Bill, sharing that. Thank you. The word I was looking for was um, when we were talking was um, low irrigation for landscape. Um, Talbert just mentioned about, what did you say about turf? The artificial grass. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Artificial turf. Uh, I'm one. I just I despise artificial <laughs> uh, turf. You know, I I uh, I see people do it all the time. It's just my bias. Um, I just 
I just don't like art. You know, I'm one of these people, I want it natural. It just, it just feels right. But, uh, but to have artificial turf is uh, because in this Sacramento heat and stuff over time, it fades and it really looks phony once it starts to lose its, its color. And, um, uh, you know, it's good for four or five years until, until that happens, but it will happen. What about aggregated rock? I think that's what they were talking about. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, I, I, I like decomposed granite. Uh, it, it makes a good, it looks like dirt, uh, but it's really durable. Um, and, uh, and if you put that and put plants in, in and around with decomposed granite, it always looks neat. It looks nice. It's natural. It, uh, you know, water can penetrate it and go through when we do have rain. Um, I do a lot of landscaping, uh, with it. Homes, homeowners really like it. So I'm, you know, uh, as people wanted to convert homes wanted to convert to get rid of lawns and, and do this. I always push them that way to do it. Uh, that's just yeah. one of my hobbies uh, is landscaping. I love doing it. So anyway. Again, you know, to support what Larry is saying is that the minerals, the rock formations, really, if they're crushed, they can really activate life, plant life. And sometimes we overlook that, you know, some of the smaller rocks and pebbles in our home backyard is, is causing uh, the activation and the livelihood of, of different plants. What I like to suggest is do something very simple, you know, put one great big boulder in there with a few uh, succulents and, and a bed of uh, decomposed granite around there. Looks very simple, stays very neat uh, for a very long time. And you have that big chair sitting in there and it, um, no maintenance. Uh, and it's got kind of a, even kind of a, an Asian uh, flair to it that, uh, and that fits too. So that's just my suggestion. That's not my area expertise, but that's my area yeah. interest. Well, but it's a design to it. I mean, this is something yeah. that we talk about and then, you know, we bring the experts like yourself to the table and you know we have these design discussions of what works, what you've seen work, what yeah. hasn't worked. And when we were standing out there, we're looking at some installations that just hasn't worked. Or once they're there and across the city, they were not kept. You know, they were not maintained. So what's there currently are like beds of um, I don't know, rock and then big boulders. And now you got weeds going through them, you know, because whatever they didn't do. Uh, to prevent the weed growth, you know, um, coming out of those things. That's where the decomposed granite comes in. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you treat the soil to prevent the, uh, you know, the germination of the seeds and, and that sort of thing, it really does it. And if we're supposed to maintain it for five years, I think, uh, you know, maybe uh, every two or three months you go by and uh, do a little um you know uh weed abatement and that sort of thing i think it would it wouldn't uh wouldn't take much because once you have gotten all the seeds out uh then it pretty well sustains itself and i've thought very much about how to maintain succulents uh without any water and i would put a uh, bed of water underneath underground so um it would sit feed the water and uh, you could uh, maybe bring some artificial, I mean, outside water to it once every month or so. And uh, yeah, I think they would do it just fine. Well, I think, uh, Pastor Larry, we're not gonna only need you to fabricate all those metal chairs, but we're gonna need you to help, you know, with that component as well. You seem to, <laughs> to have that down, okay? Well, oh, yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, it's just that, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of it, um, you know, and uh, in fact, I just, I took courses in it in college. Uh, 
uh, you know, my uh, one of my undergrad degrees is urban planning, and I did a lot of this kind of stuff. And um, it was, um, you know, I've thought about it for many, many years, and and I have, um, you know, I, I just I just have a feel for what I like, what works. I've looked at other people's work. They everybody puts it in. Every it looks beautiful when they put it in but over time is when it fails. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we got to look at is right. over time. So I like the um, idea of the burlap. I know someone mentioned they were wrapping something with burlap. And uh, that's really great if you use the right kind of paints like an acrylic or even I would think about using house paint use right. house paint because that's made that type of paint is made and so it doesn't fade as easily uh you can still get a great uh variety of colors using house paint uh then also it could be an ongoing activity because as the burlap starts to disintegrate uh, someone could come in and like add to the burlap, not take away what's already there, but add to it. So it will be more or less like a continuous sculpture. So if it starts maybe after a year, you need to freshen it up, add more burlap and repaint it. And then it could be painted uh, 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 trendy. You know, it could be flowers. I know you guys don't have the seasons out in California, but maybe have something that's indicating a particular holiday like Juneteenth came up. So you could paint over what was already painted. So it could be a continuous uh, 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 piece of work, piece of art, uh, you know, so that would, when you said the burlap, that sort of, that piqued my interest because that burlap is gonna change. So add to the change by either adding more burlap and or repainting. And uh, that's pretty easy. Thank you so very much, Ms. Wanda. I love that. Um, one of the things we didn't mention also uh, in the parking lot, we're, we're talking about putting a few um, totem poles. Mm. Um, so that's an additional feature uh, that uh, we talked about placing in areas in the back parking lot and even further down Florin Road um, off of East, is that East Parkway where that Chevron gas station is? Um, what is the name of that street, uh, Alpha? Can't think of it right now. I don't remember. But uh, a place in. Uh, down there by Morris Creek. Uh, in that area, there's there's two areas. The area she just mentioned, Morris Creek, and then across the street by Home Depot, um, uh, there's a similar area, but placing um, at least three to four um, totem poles. And normally we would divide the totem poles into uh, two by two sections, but we're gonna just use, um, is it, what is the dimensions on that, uh, Alpha? Two by, uh, two by 10. Okay, just one flat piece on each side. So it'll be four sides. So mm -hmm. Devon, have you, you have those images ready? Yes, I'm gonna start. Because he can talk about because uh, he's working with this uh, restoring these four totems that I did in Chicago. And because they were done with the wrong wood in the installation at over time, they have, you know, uh, you could talk about the state of them. If you like. mm -hmm. uh, yep, I'm just uh, gathering, uh, going to send them. Sorry. All right, I think that's it. Okay. All right, uh, can everybody see them? Yes. Uh, it's, it's currently sharing, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, the, current, the current temporary design. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a 3D design of, a, uh, of the uh, third eye chakra. 
with the uh, with a saying, uh, "This planet, this planet is our oyster." Uh, again, it's a uh, sort of a eco um, uh, reverse camouflage where the foreground, where the background is brought to the foreground. Um, also, it's done in a uh, chrome paint. Uh, the uh, it's it, yeah the uh, the third eye chakra is done in chrome paint. Uh, that chrome paint is uh, kind of like what Bill was saying with the architecture. So here in Chicago, a lot of uh, the public art and architecture, uh, the, it uses uh, uh, for instance, like a lot of the buildings are all chrome, uh, which they call like a glass curtain or uh, or the beam or the um, the Yoko Ono flower and uh, the Japan the Japanese Phoenix Garden. Uh, in Hyde Park, uh, kind of like those uh, those pieces, that chrome uh, paint, it reflects the colors around it. So for instance, if you look at the last picture, uh, at the, the the logo at the bottom, it's, uh, it's more like green and uh, it reflects more of the grass where at the top it's more white like or, or yellowish kind of like the, uh, the sky around it, um, yeah. Uh, some more details be added, for instance, like uh, more uh, more silver touches within the clouds, uh, kind of just to add that realistic effect uh, within those. Uh, but yeah, but oh, and then the three the 3D effect uh, by putting the uh, the angling angling the image on the corner, you know, it provides sort of a 3D effect. Uh, is that made out of plywood? Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, sheets of plywood, yeah. Uh, if it's not marine grade, it will not uh, last. My, but may I make another suggestion? Mm -hmm. Why don't you just get a great big culvert pipe? You know, they make them that big instead of having it square, make it round and put that and, uh, and, uh, and put it there. You can put some cutouts in it and uh, then paint it the way you like and it'll be there forever. And, uh, and it's cheaper, in my opinion, uh, a big culvert pipe uh, in, in vertical than uh, building that. Uh, wait, let me write that down. Um, hey, that I could be a good suggestion for what we're doing in, um, you know, in Sacramento. These are already like rolled into the ground, you know, with- uh, Oh, well, talk, to, talk to me. I'll, 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 I'll tighten you up. I'll tell you how to do it. We can do it. Uh, <laughs> and I agree. I, I agree with the, um, you know, with the Marine grade. Uh, and uh, so these were supposed to have been in 2014. These were supposed to have been temporary installations. Do you have some of the other um, slides of the space before and how it deteriorated? Did you? you uh, uh, let me check. Yeah, I think um, I'm uh, you, Right. And so when he went down, um, to a, make an assessment of um, like there was a lot of course the the wood that they purchased was just oh this is going to be a temporary installation this is not going to be up for a period of time well now it's a period of time that they've been up and so it, it means that the all this wood has to be taken down and then it has to be restored right and so it has to be restored with the right marine grade wood and then the youth are going to start painting on it in July and August and do another installation. These are temporary installations of the wood um, because with the snow and then direct heat, the, the, this pressed wood that they use uh, are purchased for this project because they were cheap and didn't want to do what I asked them to do. And so now the problem is the wood rot, you know, and uh, it didn't persevere even 10 years being out here. Yep. Um, it, these murals, these are murals, you know, and what we decided instead of them being just like the regular flat murals that we would make them structures. And, and we've been doing these in Sacramento um, ooh, for 20 years now, and there are different locations. Um, and I have went back and looked at the ones that were done correctly um, and they're still standing, you know, uh, like this one right here, it needs some work uh, on it to go back in and seal it. Um, one of our teams did this, uh, this one, the black and uh, gold one at the corner right there. And then the others are temporary installations of, um, of art until we start the actual project, you know. 
they always show yeah. in videos on the news and it's like the condition that they were in is not unacceptable. They ha it has to be restored. Okay. And I got a call this morning from the alderman's office that uh, someone that got funding, like Bill got funding from the University of Chicago to do his environmental garden. This, or, this nonprofit <laughs> got funding to build um, community gardens. And I suggested that they go back in and put the planter between the, um, the totem poles but they uh, could only sustain it for a year. And I'm thinking, well, if only a year, you were coming back to the same problem that the other planters that um, were, were there had, that there was no upkeep, you know, after that first year. They just want to plop it down, make it beautiful this first year and not have a commitment thereafter because they're looking at their funding will be exhausted and they're not going to come back in, you know, when you do placemaking, it's about being in the community. People uh, walk past, you know, your art. They experience your art. It's about the pedestrians that, that visit this area by our trains. The, the, the Green Line train is right there. Um, and it's a highly visible area. So it's really important that we put the right, you know, like you said, you got to, you know, you suggested this here, um, marine grade and also the cylinder. And so we need to look at what didn't work assess it and bring in something that's going to work and stay there longer. You were going to say, Devon, the condition, you want to talk about the condition of that wood and the recommendations that you and Rick made? Uh, uh, so far, we, have, we haven't actually gotten that far, but uh, as far as the, uh, the current installation that's up, it, it is temporary. We did use uh, plywood. Uh, um, as, you know, as a temporary medium until uh, until we actually, you know, can get marine grade uh, uh, material, you know, to last a lot longer. Um, but uh, do you want me to go further into like, uh, like you know, um, the condition uh, of the wood when you went down there and looked at it and assessed it? Oh yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I got you. Uh, yeah, that was yeah, it was actually pretty bad. It, it was very bad. It was very rotted out. Uh, so basically, if you kind of see this uh this this black one here. Basically, that was uh, the same as the last, the next, the last three. Um, you know, we, you know, we tore it all. Well, yeah, I tore it all down, and uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it was, it was terrible. It, it, it definitely is something that should be sealed. Um, you know, something that should be able to withstand the weather. You know, uh, it's something that's treated just all together. You know, um, it, and the people, as far as uh, you know. Uh, how the people felt about the installation as I was taking it down, they were, you know, I, you know, I had some people saying, what, you're taking it down, what, like, where is it, you know, um, you know, I, I reassured them, you know, that, you know, something else will be coming up uh, in the near future, but, uh, you know, it, it was something that they definitely cared about, yeah, mm -hmm. but, you know, like Alpha said, the condition of it, uh, however, and the, you know, the upkeep of it was, you know, a little, you know, it was definitely unacceptable. You might want to look at eventually even using some other kind of materials that is for building homes, like siding, uh, you know, uh, plastic siding that can be painted, uh, you know, maybe looking at that as a material in the future, especially in Chicago, where the weather is so extreme. With the marine grade, I mean, even with the migration garden signage, it started growing mushrooms. It, the wood was not the right wood. So they, they had to take the sign down, get the marine grade wood, go in and, you know, cut it and, you know, cut it, um, you know, as a cutout, you know, um, and then redo it and then repaint it and reseal it. But again, this was a project that was installed by, at first by you um, with Sacred Keepers Sustainability Lab. And they had children from kindergarten all the way up to the university uh, students. And so maybe the layers of paint weren't as uh, thick as they should have been. Uh, and maybe the prepping of the wood wasn't as good as it should have been. So these other variables, even though you get the wood, it's how you treat the wood, how you seal, stain it, um, prime it, um, and then how the application of the paint, um, and, um, and then how you seal it you know, with the correct, um, you know, uh, 
you know, the supplies with the, you know, we say we well, need this, like we use Procida eyes and Nova colors and because of the uh, ultraviolet, um, well, the, well, the consistency of the paint that we need, it has to be top grade. All the materials that you use have to be top grade. If you don't, you have this problem with your work being uh, deteriorating and the wood not withstanding nature. Um, and, and because these were like, instead of around Chicago, you have murals that are being restored, but they've been up 20 years, you know, 30 years, you know, um, and uh, Chicago Public Art Group is going around now having artists that to restore um, the mural projects because over time they do fade, uh, especially if you're not using the right type of paint um, and then sealing these correctly. So we have the opportunity here in Sacramento to take the advice, have these design charrettes, and have the resources to be able to purchase the top grade of all of this. So we're looking at the project lasting beyond the five years that the city will take care of it, but in longevity. You know, uh, even with the metal chairs uh, and taking the advice of um, the superintendent Meeks, um, you know. Um, and taking the suggestions of the specialists that, that that's what they do and use, uh, and then again, we have the opportunity and the budget to um, purchase high grade materials for these, for these projects and not shrimp on, oh, it's temporary. So we're just gonna get the lowest grade and then put it up. And, and yeah, people did embrace this. These projects did not get destroyed. They only got destroyed when the wood was rotten, faded. That's when people started pulling panels off. I don't know, it just irked them for us to do something about it. So this year we're doing something about it and um, you know, installing them correctly and getting youth involved in painting these projects. And that's the same, you know, for Sojourner Truth, you know. Uh, Pastor Larry? Uh, yes. Uh, what would, would you say use instead of the uh, wood uh, for the, uh totem poles you said use what what was the material oh, i i um if you want to i was looking at it i i didn't know you wanted to keep it square if it was if it was if we were starting from scratch i would get a big culvert uh you know pipe basically it's what they run water through under roads and things like that and uh and it had and it's dip uh and it's got dimples in it, you know, and um, and it's really really cool if you think of it artistically. It'd really be funky. It will last forever. It's galvanized metal, and uh, and get uh, you know get somebody like me. You can uh, change it and put cutouts in it and all kinds of that. But then give it to the artist to, to paint it. And it could really be cool. It will last forever. Uh, That's something that we could probably write into, like I'm working on another placemaking, a National Endowment for the Arts placemaking grant. This one's already solidified in terms of what it is that we're going to do for okay. this year. And you're doing the King Obama um, chairs. Out, not, no, they're not chairs. This is the screens that you're doing, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that so was, that was that part of it. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you say whatever. Yeah, that was the freestanding uh, uh, metal slab that would have um, the negative. You would, I guess, the negative cutout uh, space of uh, uh, President Obama and Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, okay. kind of. Yeah, a big square slab. I guess so. So much thickness would be needed for it to be freestanding, but. Um, Back to those pipes, I definitely, you know, maybe see putting like three of them together to create like a triangular shape or even four together if, if, if they're oh, yeah. uh, thin enough to be able to do that, you know, and oh, not yeah. just have, because I don't know how, you know, big they are as far as the round. They shape. are, they are three feet, four feet uh, Different sizes in though. diameter, in diameter. Okay. They're big. Okay. All right. So we definitely got. So we were talking about visiting your studio um, this week, uh, Pastor Meek. So we, I guess, uh, we'll call you when we get off of this. Yeah, like I said, if you want to over now, I'm I'm sitting in there. 
uh, eating a cracker. So anyway, <laughs> I, I keep turning off my uh, video so you don't see me. Well, it is a cafe. So if you guys are having lunch, that's fine. If you're drinking Starbucks, <laughs> that's fine. But it's a cafe. Um, you know, so we'd like to hear from some of the other artists that are just you know, listening in and, uh, you know, uh, maybe they have some questions about the type of uh, paint we're going to use on metal. Um, you know, um, Unity, you guys have any other chatter or any other comments? Ideas, vision? I have a question. I was wondering, um, because one of the mediums, the I mentioned it earlier, is that I use spray paint. I know that that kind of theoretically and kind of contradicts with ecology and kind of sustainability uh, almost uh, just because of, you know, as a pollutant. And so um, is that something um, uh, that will be allowed by Caltrans for us to use when we're doing murals or is this just going to be strictly brush um, paint? And, and that's just more of a reference. Obviously, I'm going to go with whatever where the project goes. Um, that was just a question I had in mind. Um, Shona, I think that that is probably not an issue, especially when we're doing the murals. You know, um, you know how you integrate different the mixed mediums in. You know, um, so I don't, I don't see it as an issue. She's brought you in, and that's your what you do. I don't see it as a problem, but. I can't remember who I was talking to, um, and I never do, knew this, but they said their the longevity uh, is not there in aerosol paint. I don't know. Maybe Mr. Bill, maybe you can speak to that. Um, well, I know you know, we, we've always used Nova Color or the Golden Color, you know, our house paint. But yes, sir. Yeah, you can. I've tried it uh, with some like uh, diseased trees where I. I spray painted them uh, and they survived. Uh, they're still colorful. I think you just have to, after three or four years is to, to yeah. respray or paint uh, and it, it holds up. You got about a good five years before it starts to change. From okay. I have um, a mural for a uh, okay. wood Thank you, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. But but you also have to use uh, the kind of spray paint that is for art, like, uh, and even some of that paint, like Cobra spray paint, will only last You're kind of like, a year to two years. Whereas if you use a higher quality model, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, it's making you sound weird. Your connection. Um, Use, I, I, I can add okay. to what he's what talking I said about. Was, because he's talking about the Cobra paint, which is like the lower brand tier. Yeah. But there are brands that go above that were made um, by graffiti writers, such as Montana 94s, Montana yeah. uh, Germany, um, and they have some other brands. And the lifespan of those are to, uh, in terms of like when the UV light hits. Um, go for a very long time. I was mentioning earlier that there's a woodbine mural for our, uh, over there off of 47th. Um, I painted, uh, I believe in 2017 or 18, I can't remember. And the colors are still vibrant. Like, like UV light hits it every day. And um, it's just something that, um, but it's obviously, I use the very, like the highest quality of spray paint. But yeah, that's yeah. what uh, Unity and was saying, that there's lower brands. Oh, sorry. Even of the artistic spray paint, they're cheaper. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, even with, the artist, even with the artistic quality of spray paint, like Cobra is on the low end of that spectrum, whereas Montana 90, 95, or I forget the number on it, that's a higher quality. I wanted to ask you, how long did that um, mural last you? Uh, I guess it's still going. How long has it been up and it's still vibrant with the Montana? Uh, um, so yeah, I painted it in like 2017 or 18. So that's already um, 
four years um, unfaded on, and they didn't even seal it. They told me they sealed it and I tried to like seal it. But, um, the district, they have their workers obviously through the union who seal stuff. But um, at the principal at the time told me that they didn't come and seal it. So that means that these colors unsealed are still exposed to the elements. And that paint that I used, I used the bare exterior paint and then I used uh, Montana. Now, now all that paint is still vibrant. Every time I, I pass by there because my mom lives in South Sac. And so I, every time I'm looking at it, um, I'm always checking it up for like maintenance or anything, even though they are not asking me, I'm always looking at it to like see if it's still chipping or anything and it's still vibrant, so yeah. So let me ask this question, um, Unity, you're on mute. You're, you're on mute. <laughs> And those cans are going to run about six to nine dollars each, depending on how many you buy. And yeah, you gotta you gotta go to uh, the store, leave your mark in Sacramento, which is a local uh, uh, store here in Sac that um, that sell it at price value. They don't they don't try to like upsell you like Blick or other stores that charge about nine to ten dollars, which isn't like um, you know when you think about it. Obviously, it's they're trying to make money, but the store leave your mark they're very much um thinking about the artists and uh the quality of the paint is not decreased at all so let me ask you this um what is i know that when i was here and i was in charge of the mural programs uh, through the arts commission and we were banned from using uh you know um certain sealants um is that banned still here that they wrap buses on, uh, with um they were saying that it was environmentally um, unsafe to use. Um, I don't know really much about that. Oh my! Um, so all, all I know is that, like, obviously uh, there was a um, label from a certain year that spray paint had that was like tearing into the ozone, and they yeah. stopped using a certain chemical in those spray cans. The spray cans, Montana ninety fours, Montana Golds. Uh, have to go through obviously like the FDA and all that to get approved for that. And there's a particular chemical that isn't um, in those cans anymore. Back in the day, they used to have them. And I think that was like in the 90s. Yeah, like in the 90s, like they had that um, that that chemical you're talking about. So I don't I I don't think they they have them anymore. Otherwise, because um, a lot of this product comes from Spain and Germany, and they wouldn't be able to enter the United States because of that. So. So. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Pastor uh, Larry, is she still there? He's there. Uh, He's on mute. Pastor Larry? He must have stepped away. Okay, so um, let's, um, Bill, did you have um, any other comments about um i'm here i just couldn't unmute myself okay <laughs> so uh i want to go back to what alpha was asking earlier um after you fabricate the metal chairs um we will be able is there a certain primer that we have to use and any particular paint uh I think I, I've been told once the uh, metal is primed, you can use a, a regular acrylic paint. Can you just confirm that, please? Oh, that that's true. You can. Mm -hmm. You can use, um, you know, once you've uh, got it and you've cleaned all the oil off of it, you know, and um, all you have to do is uh, take and, uh, uh, you know, spray it with hot water and melt, get all the oil off of it. You can do anything you want with it. Any particular primer? No, um, I'm I'm always into powder coating. I do a lot of powder coating and have my my work done, but um, but that's not what you guys that, that's not what we're going to do here. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I don't have any particular one. I like to use galvanized paint uh, to start with as a, as an undercoating because it lasts. I found the galvanizing last, you know, cold galvanizing lasts as, as, as long as uh, hot galvanizing. So if once you put that uh, cold galvanizing on, spray it with galvanizing, then you can paint it, paint on top of it anything you want. And uh, anything you think is durable, 
Um, I was listening to you about the spray paints. I've uh, the metals that I've used I, uh, since I'm metal. I get I go to the automotive uh, stores and buy good automotive paint, and uh, they last on metal for years and years and years and years. So, but anyway, but that's just my experience. Well, your, that's your expertise and you're sharing that with us and you're making these suggestions and I'm writing everything down so that when we get ready to start purchasing our supplies and stuff, we're getting the things that are going to last. Um, some of the other projects, um, they, the city is making sure that they're sustaining their public art projects in perpetuity, right? But for our project, we have a five year. So we need to look at that, you know what I mean? And make sure that we're getting the correct and taking the recommendations from it and consult with our, the experts in the field um, before we even get started on this. And that's what we're doing. And I really appreciate all, all of your comments. Yeah, I got public art pieces that have been up now 30 years or so, and they look almost as good as the day I put it up. So, you know, that um, they last if uh, you put the money in it and do it right. Uh, but if you try to cheap it, uh, in a few years, it will look that way. So, we um, have Judah. Judah hasn't made any comments. He's here. Uh, he's one of the artists on the team. Um, Judah. I'm kind of just going with the flow, to be honest. Um, I don't really have any like questions or concerns right now. But yeah, I'm writing everything down as well. <laughs> because these are trainings uh, as well for our young artists that are coming on um, and, and we'd like for you to ask questions you know have some insights you know talk about your experience because this is all a learning process for all of us mm -hmm. what, what about lee is he i know lee was on a, another zoom call too but artist lee i don't know if he has any questions he might still be on that other zoom call but judah um, I definitely uh, recommend all the young artists on here, Unity, Fisco, all of you add this to your portfolio, this tr particular training, you know, it, 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 it's a, it'd be excellent for your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So, um, Bill, do you have any closing? Um, yeah, I would, I would say seeing an installation as a canvas, um, you know, painting on canvas, and all the elements that surround that. For example, I'm, I'm working on a project uh, with uh, the Obama Foundation to create a welcome to Woodlawn signage. But within that space, you know, there, there are succulents or uh, drought tolerant plants. You, you want to look at levels and different stages of development within that, that space that would activate a pleasant surrounding or a good design for installation. One location that we didn't really talk about and that's that Morrison Creek area coming down Florin. Um, and it's um, like, I don't know if you guys uh, pay attention when I would like for you when you're visiting the museum or coming down Florin to really go out before we begin this. And, and we're, what we say is photograph the areas before we get started on it. So then when we come back to the design charrette, you can make recommendations for how you view it, how you see it, you know, and then we kind of collaborate on uh, when we begin our design processes. Um, the retaining wall on Morrison Creek is really low. I think it may be two feet. And then they have this silicone, you know, that, what is it, metal fencing? you know, where people have cut through it. Um, the city would really like um, something to happen there to kind of start the, um, you know, the beautification project and go down to Tamashana. But think about what can happen with that, um, that wall that's right there on both sides, basically uh, of the creek, right? To keep people from falling in it or walking over it. But it's a, a small retaining wall that may be two feet. And I know one of our community partners, um, they uh, are working with the um, uh, air and water pollution problems in uh, Sacramento. Shona, who, what's her name? Uh, Felicia with Escape Velocity. Right. And so we probably will meet with them to get some ideas from their group 
you know, and how to incorporate, you know, um, that messaging uh, as part of that project. Um, and then we're going to take some ideas from this meeting, moving away from maybe the um, traditional totem poles that we've been doing throughout the years uh, in these garden installations and maybe move to the, uh, um, the galvanized cylinder that Larry was recommending that we do for that area up there. That's, a, that's another great idea. But I would like for you guys at some point when you're going down floor to look at that. And I think with your aerosol, it would really work there. It would be fast to, to get that lower levels done and, you know, around that area. And we'll probably be sharing more information as far as photos tomorrow for tomorrow evening's meeting, uh, photos of the areas that we're talking about and uh, and of the chairs that we did previously in wood for the uh, Macro Valley High Community Center, but they're tearing up already. You know that's why we 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 already knew we wanted to continue that concept of those chairs, but we needed to uh, switch to metal for the longevity of those chairs. And so uh, we're glad to have Pastor uh, Larry Meeks on board with us. Um, in addition, in addition to the murals and the and the totem poles and the uh, burlap on the trees and and the murals, um, we're you know we have another group that we're working with to um, uh, do uh, street banners. Um, how many? 30, 32 banners, um, Alpha. Is it thirty two banners? Yeah, I think so. I have to look at the. 30, I think yeah, down Florham Road. So, and we're dedicating pretty much, um, uh, we'll be working with uh, youth as well, bringing them aboard, but the concept around those banners will be dedicated to artists, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, the, 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 the poets, you know, like Langston Hughes and other uh, poets, you know, during that time. And so, um, but again, we'll get a better visual to everyone tomorrow. Uh, 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 at 5 p.m. I'll share the Zoom link by this evening. We're missing two other artists on the Zoom call that that's, that that will be actually three. We have uh, Malik Sanufaru from Oakland. Uh, he'll be a part of the team and um, uh, Walter, and Walter um, Anderson and, and Taylor. So those are the three that couldn't make the Zoom call. But I think we have a pretty strong team and and with this project, um, I'm sure the city is pleased and Caltran uh, is pleased with the work that we do that uh, we will have room to apply for more work, you know, in other areas in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. that would and I, I, would like, I would like to say this. I think your voices have been helpful. It's been tremendous because I think what we need to do is reassess design's role in relation to social and environmental issues. And I think this is what we're, you know, we're taking a second look. All right, thank you both yep. for that. And one of the things that the um, uh, city utility districts are sending their architects out and creating a template. And they wanna use this template with what we're doing on Foreign Road for the rest of the city. So they're gonna do the architectural designs, you know, that we talked about, what we went over and, um, and then, uh, uh, so yeah, that'll be our next step. Uh, that'll happen for what we did. And we did our walkthrough envisioning there at Tamashanner and Florida. Thank you, Bill, for a wonderful presentation. I love your garden, your beautiful uh, gardens. They're beautiful. Just warms well, up my heart and soul. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'll, I'll try, I'm so busy, I'll, I'll try to make it to more of the, uh, uh, cafe meetings. Okay, we meet uh, weekly. Um, Laura, did you want to talk about what you're presenting next week? Sure. So, um, Kiela is in Jamaica this week, but we are leading a discussion about how artists can collaborate and create space. So we shared a few um, case studies, but we're going to talk about um, kind of next steps and 
different model and how we can build teams to collaborate. So that's next week at work. So we are talking about, yeah, we're talking about buildings and what it takes to create <clears throat> um, space. So it's, it's monumental planning. <laughs> yeah, and the projects are all, you know, we're talking about work lives space and combining it with commercial space and who needs to be on your team to help you put a, a development plan together. And um, Laura and um, Kayla with Artists Design the Future, they're leading our um, feasibility plan for um, uh, the capital campaign that uh, Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum will be launching, um, launching this year, or actually the beginning of next year. So they'll be leading that feasibility study. All right, any other comments? I have a question. Yes. Um, do you guys, I, I know with the exception of where Tam O'Shanter is and like going eastward on Florin, the specific maybe like addresses for like Morrison Creek on Florin, I know there's like French Road or South Watt. I'm not sure. Uh, is that because I want to go and photograph that stuff today? Where are you coming from? Well, I live in the north. I usually travel that area because my mom lives in that area. Come down 99, I, take Florin, like you go into the um, yeah. museum. And you'll see the creek. <laughs> it's very no, yeah. I, I so I just want to document that stuff. Uh, should I start documenting from South Walk? Um, because that's where like that the creek area start is. Start documenting at Florin uh, when you turn off Florin right there, because we're, the other side of it is the county. Oh, it only starts where Morrison Creek starts, where the Home Depot is. Yeah, it's all the way down to Tamashana. That's the oh. district right there. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. You see Home Depot, you're right there. Okay. There. And on the, yeah, and on the other side is that Chevron ga gas station. So it's across the street, uh huh, Morrison Creek. Right before the freeway? Yeah, if, well, you're, you're coming from the opposite direction. So you're going to see a Chevron on the left hand side, and then Morrison Creek is right there in front of it at the corner. Got it. There. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Got it. I'll start, uh, I'll document uh, pictures for that to bring. Uh, for you know, thank you it. morrison creek i saw it i'm here in mather so even as i'm driving to mather i see morrison creek comes all the way out here in the meanders you know um, way out uh, in this county area but yeah everything we're working with the city um and so the city is all going um what is that toward i-5 uh, that's going uh okay south north that's going uh, west Am I correct? Yeah, all the way down to Tamashana. That is what the Thorn Road uh, uh, partnership and the Thorn Road district is. The ideas that you wanted uh, for Morrison Creek, the um, to keep uh, what is it to keep people from going into it? Uh, uh, it that's right there at the Home Depot, right? Right. Um, okay. Well, they wanted something to be done. And so that's where we need to brainstorm and talk about what can be done. With done when you say done, done to do what? That's what she said. She goes, we need something to happen, some kind of design. We would really like for us to think about a design concept for Morrison Creek, you know, that entryway into the district, because it's one of the places where we used, when we did the um, Earth Day and we had the cleanup, because we have to stage so many cleanups in the next two years that that was one of the areas where they staged and had people kind of clean up that creek area from debris, trash, you know, all that, um, you know, that accumulated in that area. So that's one of the stops. So you want some kind of uh, some barrier or something up there or just uh, artwork to go up there? Because I got a cool idea. I, I think that on. whatever you suggest right now in our planning processes, then you know that because it's all about the charrette and what we can produce. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll take a look at it and uh, see. All right. So I think you're thinking of something that serves as a utilitarian purpose to stop the debris and garbage from other people. I mean, from people coming in. 
as far as the art design? I, yeah. I think well, so. Yeah. I was I was thinking, see, I, I have an idea that would really be an eye catcher for uh, Morrison Creek, very tasteful. Uh, I think it'd be good for the community. I have a maquette that I've done. I was going to use it for something else, but I, as you were talking, I said, huh, that would really work well there, um, you know, and um, just see if they want to do it, if they have the funds to, to uh, you know, to do it and share the idea. Okay, so. awesome. That's what we're, um, why we're having this design charrette so that we can okay. come as many possibilities for that space. I think what's happening when I went by there and I didn't photograph because the men were standing around there and I, and I know they probably are, why are you taking pictures? I just wanted to go when there's no one parked there. They cut the fence so sometimes homeless can crawl through and create the camps there. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So um, we have to look at and talk with Home Depot and then negotiate this, right? And how they can partner with us and the city uh, utility district um, partner with us to help, you know, um, you know, kind of clean up that area, kind of bait them from cutting those fences and going through and, and you know, creating um, homeless camps like that. I understand. Okay. And I and I think even if it's even if, if the scope of work that you're talking about, uh, Pastor Larry, is outside of the budget that we have now. I know that they want something there so bad. I uh, Alpha and, and Miss Lisa with the utilities department is working on uh, another grant. You know, maybe be able to fit it in that one. We're gonna yeah, keep that ball rolling. Thinking, uh -huh. Yeah, because what I want to do is uh, it's um, it's a lot bigger, and I'm talking about making something out of half inch steel, freestanding very, very strong. Nobody can cut it, mess with it, and it'll really uh, stand out to the community. And, um, and it would be a barrier for the uh, uh, homeless people. So, uh, you know, I'm, but it may be too big of a budget for what we have here. So that's what I'm thinking. You're on mute, Alpha. You're on mute. Sorry about that, but let's look at it and then talk about it on our next uh, our next visit. We have two minutes before our cafe ends. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today. And uh, each week we meet at 11 o'clock Central Pacific Standard Time and um, 1 o'clock Central Standard Time and what 2 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time on Papa Research Station Cafe. So thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Bill, for presenting. We'll thank see you. everybody tomorrow at, at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Bye-bye, right, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. 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 Talk to you later, Laura. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good discussion. I think so. Yeah.